What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and to another weekly 3D model. Being the first video of 2023, I wanted to have a little bit of fun this week. So we're going to throw it back to the 80s and make this old gumball machine. So throughout this video, we'll be going over the full 3D modeling, UV mapping, and texturing process that I did to create this gumball machine. And we're also going to be using Maya's mash network so we can create some physics on those gumballs so we can drop them into our machine. So without me dragging this on anymore, let's just dive into it. Alright, so to get this thing started, we're going to select a cylinder, we can start blocking out that main body shape. So if you look at this reference photo that I grabbed off of Google, you can see that there's those little indents that go all the way around the body. So what I'm going to do is increase my subdivisions up to 40, that way I can have the proper amount of those indents around that main body shape. So I quickly did the math and what I'm going to do is select every other face, so it's going to be every sixth face going around this body and I should have the correct amount of faces that I need to extrude. Now if you look at the very front where those gumballs drop out of, there's those two little indents or rivets that are closer together, so we're just going to keep four spaces apart on the front. Then all I'm simply going to do is just delete those top and bottom faces off of the cylinder. I can select all of those faces that I mentioned all around my object and then I can just extrude them to squish them in a little bit. Now to make my life easier, I'm just going to change my axis of orientation to component. That way I can just scale in one of these faces and all of the other faces will follow along. And after I scale that face in, then I can just simply extrude it once again to create that little bump. And then once I hit 3 on my keyboard and smooth it out, hopefully I have a similar indent or that little rivet shape that's similar to my reference photo. Now after hitting 3 on my keyboard to preview smooth the object, it was looking a little bit too rounded. So what I originally was planning to do was just select all of those edges and give them a small bevel, but I just quickly changed my mind and I thought I would just use that target weld tool to weld together those vertices. That way I can remove one of those edges around those extrusions that I made. And hopefully this will fix my problem and give me a better result once I smooth it out. So once all of those target welds are finished and I hit 3 on my keyboard to preview smooth the object, it looks much better and more accurate to that reference photo. And very simply, just like that, we have our main body shape blocked out. So next up is just working on that little spot where those gumballs drop out of. And that's pretty straightforward, we're going to select those front faces and I can just extrude them outwards to block out that shape. So quickly jumping back to our reference photos, you'll see that the very bottom of our shape, it kind of comes out a little bit. There's a little extrusion and a little lip on the very bottom. So we need to recreate that. So all I'm going to do is add another edge loop, just so I can start blocking out where that edge is going to be. Then simply just select all of those edges or vertices and I can scale them outwards to create that little lip or edge on the very bottom. Now this shape is just a bit tricky only because that little area where those gumballs drop out of, there is no bottom edge or lip. So once we extrude all of those vertices, I just need to jump back to that small area just so I can align all of those vertices properly so there is no edge around that bottom area. And as you can just see, I use that multi-cut tool just to add one more edge on the very top to connect those vertices. That way it's easier for me to block out the shape. Once I align all of those vertices, I can add one more edge loop on the top so I can block out where that cutout is going to be, where those gumballs come out of. And I can simply just select all of those faces and remove them. So once I remove all of those faces, I can double click that edge around this opening and just extrude it inwards a tiny bit to give it a little thickness. Now right above this small opening, there's a large metal plate right where you insert the money. So we can just remove all of those faces on the cylinder since they're not going to be in our scene and they're not really needed. Now as you can see, once I hit 3 on my keyboard and I preview smooth the shape, all of those edges are a little bit too rounded and I need to strengthen them up a bit. So all I'm going to do is just add a few edge loops depending on where I want to strengthen up those edges. So once I hit 3 on my keyboard, it looks more accurate to my reference photo. I'm also going to select those edges right around that opening where those gumballs drop out of and I can give them a small bevel. That way when I just hit 3 once again, it's just going to strengthen up that area a bit. Now if you look back at the reference photos, you'll see that we created that one lip on the bottom, but there's one more just below that. And that's nice and rounded and it doesn't have any rivets or really any bumps to it. So we're going to do the exact same process. We're going to double click that bottom edge and we can extrude it downwards and outwards a little bit just so we can create that small edge. 
Now after that extrusion, we are gonna have those small bumps or rivets where those little indents were on our main body shape. So we just need to go and select those vertices and we can drag them outwards to round out that bottom shape. Alright, and just like that, our main shape is complete. Now I'm just going to go once again, add a few extra edge loops just to strengthen up that bottom edge. Now I'll just have to play around with the shape just a tiny bit more just to make sure it looks nice and rounded on the bottom. So after hitting three on my keyboard and preview smoothing the object, I notice in those little areas around the bottom edge, right where those indents are, there's really no strength on that edge. You can see it's more rounded in those specific areas. Now that's simply just because there's no edge actually strengthening up that edge once I'm preview smoothing it. So what I need to do is using that multi-cut tool, I can go and start adding my own edge loop and just connecting those vertices so I can add one little small edge around those little areas. So I'm just going to zoom in and fix this up a tiny bit. So once I hit three on my keyboard and I smooth it out, that whole edge around the very bottom of my object is going to be strengthened up and it's going to look accurate to that reference photo. All right, so things are looking good and our main shape is coming together. Now I just quickly noticed how it seems to taper a tiny bit at the top. It seems that the bottom of this gumball machine is a little bit wider. So I'm just gonna select all of those vertices on the very top and I can scale them in a tiny bit just to give it that small tapering the shape has. Now I am just winging the shape along the way so we will have to play around with it and my reference photos aren't the greatest. I just grabbed the first ones that jumped out to me on Google Images. So like I mentioned, we will have to play around with things to make it look a little bit more accurate. So next up is just blocking out that main front metal shape where you insert those coins. So I'm simply just going to add in a cube, scale that nice and thin, and I can throw that into that spot and we can start blocking out that shape. Now this shape specifically was causing me some problems and you see later on in the video what I'm talking about, but I really didn't know how I was going to approach this model and that's a little bit on my fault for not preparing myself and just diving into this and just seeing what we can create. But if you prepare your model a little bit and you know how you're going to tackle it, it can really help you approach these shapes a little bit easier and there's not going to be so much problem solving along the way. Now I noticed how this metal piece follows those little indents or rivets on that main body shape. So what I'm going to do is add some edge loops and I can start following those little grooves or indents that are right below it. Now looking back, I probably wouldn't have added these edge loops yet. I would have created that main shape where those coins go into first and then I would have simply extruded these bottom faces just to follow those grooves. However, I didn't really know how I was going to tackle this like I mentioned, so I decided to add those edge loops in now. So now that we have that main bottom shape of this metal piece complete, I can simply double click all of those edges and give them a small bevel. That way once I hit 3 on my keyboard and smooth it out, it can retain and hold its shape. Now I'm just going to spin this object around and I can delete all of those faces on the back end since we don't need them. Now there is a small extrusion on the very top of this metal shape, so I should have waited until I removed all of those back faces until I finished blocking everything out. So this just caused me a little bit of extra work since I noticed after I deleted those faces, so I just need to go to the top, I can extrude that edge a little bit more and then just rework it a tiny bit just so I can strengthen up those edges once again. So let's just play around with this shape a little bit more until we finish blocking everything out.
All right, so that metal piece is all blocked out and things are looking good, but the whole objects in general are looking a little bit off compared to my reference photo. It seemed like the whole object tapered in a little bit more at the top. So what I'm gonna do is just zoom back out. I'm gonna go to my front facing camera view and I can simply add in an image plane, that same reference photo we were using, and I can use that as some sort of a guidance to make sure my shapes are accurate. So once that image plane is in position, we can go play around with the shape a little bit more just to make it look more accurate to its true shape. Now keep in mind the reference photo I'm using isn't perfectly orthographic, it's kind of like a perspective front facing view, so the image is going to be a little bit off, but I'm not going to obsess over it, I'm just going to use it as some sort of a guidance so I can make my shape look a little bit more accurate. Alright, so things are looking better now, now let's jump back to the very top of the shape and create that small edge. So very similar to the very bottom, we're going to select all of those top edges on the top, and we can extrude them inwards to create that little tiny lip. I'm just gonna speed up this next part and I'll explain exactly what I'm doing. So what I noticed is that the very front plate of my object was looking a little bit too thin and it seemed like those outside edges near the top were closer to that metal plate in my reference photo. And I was trying to figure out what was exactly causing it. And I think when I originally cut out that hole into this object, it was just a bit too thin. So you'll see soon enough in the video, I just end up removing some of those faces to make it a little bit wider. And then I can insert that main metal plate and it would look closer to that reference photo. And also in that little area where those gumballs drop out of, it seemed like it was fairly straight and it didn't taper too much. And I noticed in my model it was tapering too much, so I just ended up grabbing all of those faces on the very bottom or vertices and just scaling them in a tiny bit. So let's just play around with the shape a tiny bit until I get it looking a little bit more accurate, and then we can move on to a few more exciting things. One quick note, if you can really take away anything from this video, it would just be gather good reference and plan out your models. Since I jumped into this with little to no reference material, it seems like I ran into a lot of these problems that could have easily been avoided. So if I had good orthographic front side views of one of these gumball machines, it would probably make the whole creation of this asset a little bit easier to work with and I wouldn't have to zoom out and stare at it so much and try to figure out what was causing it to look off. However, you don't always have that reference material available, so in certain situations, sometimes you just have to work with what you have. So we're just going to continue on with what we have here, and we can just keep messing around with the shape to make it look more accurate to its true shape. So let's just continue playing around with things a little bit, and we can refine the shape a little bit more.
So finally our gumball machine is looking much more accurate and things are looking good. We can move on to a few more exciting things. So next up is just continuing on with that metal piece we created earlier. We just need to create that front piece right where you insert the money and you spin that little dial to make the money go in and the gumball drop out. Now this is definitely one piece I would have done differently if I were to redo this whole model and I will show you how I would have approached it differently soon enough. But first I will just continue on with this video and show you exactly what I did. So since we had all those edge loops already added to make those little bumps on the very bottom of this metal piece, I just decided to continue down that route. So what I originally did here was just add more edge loops. I thought maybe I could select all of those faces and circularize them just to make a nice circle shape where that cutout is. And then I thought maybe I could just move some of those vertices and just kind of follow along with my reference photo to create that circular shape. However, working with lower polys is always easier. And in this situation, I didn't do that. And because I approached it in this way, you'll notice later on how it's not actually centered properly to my gumball machine. My reference photo was maybe a little bit off. I'm not sure exactly. I was just rushing with this model. I was technically still on vacation and I was starting work soon. So I didn't want to take up my whole day modeling this. I wanted to kind of get through it fairly quickly. And I think that really backfired. So as you see here, after adding all of those edge loops, I use that multi-cut tools to start tracing around that reference photo to create that rounded shape. My thought was after I basically created that shape, I can select all of those faces and extrude it outwards to create that little extrusion. Now to be honest, this was definitely not the best approach to the shape. I should have started something way less in polys and it would have been more accurate and would have looked more rounded and just better in general. However, I started just digging this hole and I feel like the hole just got deeper and deeper and I just wanted to finish the shape and move on to more exciting things. So I just decided to continue down this route. But I don't always wanna show you exactly what I'm doing, especially if it's not the correct thing to do. So I'm gonna really quickly show you what I would have done differently if I were to redo this whole shape. All right, so here's the shape once I was all finished. And as you can see, it's looking a little bit warpy. It's not perfectly rounded and it's not even perfectly centered to be honest. I was actually pretty disappointed with this and I almost wanted to go back and redo it, but I just didn't have that much time. So I'm going to quickly show you what I would have done differently. So firstly, I would start off with a plane that's much lower in polys and I would have just blocked out roughly the shape in a lower poly form. And then I can go simply once again with that multi-cut tool that I did originally and I can start just tracing around that shape to create that rounded shape that I can extrude. Now there's so many different ways you can approach a shape like this. You could add a cylinder as that main rounded shape and then work around that. However, I would probably use that multi-cut tool and just trace around my reference photo, but just start off with a lower poly shape to begin with. That way it would have been more accurate and in my opinion, probably look a little bit better. So this just shows you if you plan out your shapes before you dive into them, you can create much cleaner models with much better topology and you don't have to just kind of wing it along the way like I usually do in a lot of these videos. Now if I slide the shape over and I compare it to the original one, you'll see they look very similar in shape, but one is dramatically more polys and one is much lower. So if you can take away something from this video, just plan out those models and don't just dive into it. Really think about how you're going to approach them and you'll just make your life much easier and your artwork will probably look better too. All right, so now jumping back to the video, we need to make a Boolean to cut out that hole into this rounded shape. So very simply, I'm gonna create a low poly cylinder. I can position that right where that hole is on my reference photo and I can Boolean out that hole. Once that hole is created, I can go in with that multi-cut tool and just connect all of those vertices. Now because I had so many polys when I created the shape originally, I just need to really quickly go in and clean things up a bit so it looks a little bit more rounded on the bottom. Alright, so now things are looking a bit better. Now I could have spent a bit more time cleaning things up, but I didn't want to spend all day doing this. So we're going to move on to a few other things. So next up on this shape is that tiny little piece set where you insert those coins. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it just looks like a little cube. So we're going to simply create a cube, scale that nice and small, and we can position that into place.
All right, so things are looking good. Now, once I zoomed out and I looked at my reference photo, I noticed how the very top of that metal piece we created is actually rounded and it goes with the whole bubble shape on the very top that holds all the gumballs. So I'm just gonna add a cylinder to kind of position where that shape is gonna be. And I can just add another edge loop and just make that rounded shape on the very top. Now, once again, because I didn't plan all this out, it is gonna look a little bit messy. I'm just working with what I've already created. But if I knew it was rounded originally, I would have just approached it differently. And I really think we would have created a much cleaner looking object. But we're just working with what we got. So let's go ahead and start rounding out the top of that shape and we can wrap up this whole metal object. All right, so finally that metal piece is all wrapped up. We can move on to some other things. So let's start blocking out those shapes on the inside of our gumball machine. Now, a lot of this isn't gonna be in view, but I thought we should just create it just in case you do see it. So we're gonna use that cylinder we created earlier. So what I'm gonna do is just delete all of those faces on the top and bottom, and I can start extruding that edge to create that little tiny shape. Now, I looked at a few other references on Google to see what this looked like. It just looked like a simple plastic cylinder piece, like a ring that kind of sits on the end, and that glass bubble kind of sits over top of it. So we're just gonna create some shape that looks similar to that. Now, once again, I'm not gonna obsess over these shapes since they're probably not gonna be in view, but we're just gonna add them there just in case. Right, and just like that, our inside shapes are complete. Now we can move on to that glass bubble that holds all of our gumballs. Now this is pretty straightforward. All I'm gonna do is just create a sphere, drag down those divisions to make it nice and low in polys, and I can use that reference photo to start blocking out that shape. All right, so next is just creating the very top metal piece. It's like the little hat that the gumball machine wears. And that's very straightforward once again. I'm just gonna create a cylinder, position that in place, give it a nice rounded bevel on the top. And then we can extrude the little tiny piece in the very middle that holds the little bolt. All right, so our gumball machine's looking good. We're almost there. We just have a few small things left to do. 
So firstly, we're going to jump back to that opening where the gumballs drop out of. All I need to do here is just extrude those edges a little bit more to give it a little bit more depth. So it just goes into the machine a bit more. And then I add a small cylinder to create a small plane on the bottom and the back. That way it just looks like there's a wall there that the gumballs can drop onto. Now I knew we weren't going to look upwards to see the opening where those gumballs actually drop out of, so I'm not going to create a small extrusion there, we're not going to show any camera angles upwards, so I'm just going to simplify this area. Alright, so I quickly noticed at the very top of our metal shape, right above where you insert those coins, there's a tiny extrusion, it's like a rounded shape that just sticks out, and that's a really quick fix. We're just going to zoom back in, select those faces, and I can extrude them outwards so I can create that rounded shape it has. Alright, so next up we have to create that small little dial that sits on the front that you spin to actually drop the money in and make the gumball drop out. So what we're going to do is insert a small low poly cylinder right where that hole is going to be and then we can boolean out a small little hole. Now I'm also going to really quickly add a material to our glass material so I can make it transparent. That way I can just see the insides. I want to add one extra shape on the very top that actually holds the lid together. I know you're not probably going to see that in the renders, but it's just good to add just in case you do. Now we will jump back to the shape once we finish up this little dial piece first, but I'm just going to insert a small cylinder there just so I know I have to do it later. Alright, so once that low poly cylinder is created, I'm just going to make sure it's aligned correctly with my reference photo. And very similar to how we did the other boolean, we're just going to boolean out a small little hole. So once I connect all of those empty vertices using that multi-cut tool, I can delete all of those faces on the inside and I can double click that edge and extrude it outwards. If you look at the reference photo, there's just a small little extrusion where that little dial sits in. So we're just gonna create that tiny little hole. All right, so once we created that small hole, we can create another low poly cylinder. I can position that right inside of that hole we created and then I can start blocking out that little dial or switch that you turn. So if you look at the reference photo, you'll see it not only just extrudes outwards from the side of the cylinder, it also comes forward a little bit and it kind of looks like it comes outwards on the front faces of that cylinder. Now I wanted to create something similar to that shape. A really easy one would just be extruding it outwards on each side and just wrapping it up there. But I wanted to create that little bump that this shape tends to have in these references. So all I'm going to do for that is just extrude some extra faces outwards and using that target weld tool I can weld together those front vertices. That way it creates that small little bump and once I smooth the object out, hopefully it will look similar to our reference.
All right, and just like that, our small little front dial piece is looking good. Now let's move on to a few other things. Now, because we're gonna have some renders looking kind of top down, I thought we should add a small little extrusion right where those coins go into. Now, I could probably get away with not even including this, but I thought it would just be a fun little thing to add just in case. So simply, I'm just gonna add an edge loop. I can block out where those faces are that I wanna extrude, and then all I have to do is select those faces and extrude them downwards to create that little opening where those coins insert into. All right, so next up is just working on the very bottom. Now, we're not gonna have any renders looking at the base of this object. However, rather than leaving it just open, I thought we should at least fill in this large hole. So a really quick way to do this, I'm just gonna duplicate that same main shape I have. I'm gonna double click all of those faces on the very bottom. I can just extract that from the shape itself, delete the other one so we only have that bottom little ring, and then I can extrude those inside edges just to basically merge together into one point. This is just a really quick way just to kind of fill in that area so it aligns perfectly. And then all I have to do is just double click that outside edge and extrude it upwards just to give it a little bit of thickness. All right, so last but not least, the very last object we have to model for this gumball machine is the top little screw or bolt. Now this is pretty straightforward. All I do here is create a sphere and I'm just gonna scale that nice and flat and I can position that right into that hole. Then all I'm gonna do is just create another cube and I can just basically scale that to be a nice long rectangle. And then I can position that right over my sphere where I wanna Boolean out a nice small rectangle. So once that rectangle is lined up correctly, I can Boolean out that shape and then I just need to go in with my target weld tool and weld together all of those vertices. And then using that multi-cut tool, I can just connect any other vertices together. Once all of those points are all attached, I can double click that outside edge where that Boolean was created and I can give it a very small bevel. Then once I hit three on my keyboard and I preview smooth this shape, hopefully it looks like that little bolt in our reference photo. And just like that, all of our 3D modeling is done and our gumball machine is complete. So next on the list is just creating all of those small gumballs that sit inside of this machine. Now what I decided to do was use MASH so I can basically use physics to drop all of these gumballs directly into this shape. That way I don't manually have to go in and individually align all of those gumballs to fit inside. It would take quite some time and it probably wouldn't look that realistic either. So we're gonna take advantage of Maya's mash network and we can basically create those physics to drop those balls into our container. So what I decided to do was quickly pause the video and open up a separate Maya scene so I can quickly go over it myself to remember all of the steps needed. I didn't wanna make you watch me just mess around with it until I figured out how to properly make those gumballs drop. Now when I came back into the scene to basically re-record and show you all the steps, for some reason I just couldn't get those balls to stay inside of my container. They kept following through. So what I decided to do was just reopen a separate scene, create all of those physics and the mash in a separate project. And then once those gumballs were sitting correctly inside my bowl, I could just take all of them, copy them, and paste them into my current scene and place them into our model. So let's quickly go over exactly how I did this. All right, so now in our separate Maya scene, I'm gonna create a sphere so I can block out that rough shape of our glass container. And this is the bowl that we're gonna use to drop all of our gumballs into. So all I'm gonna do is just remove those top faces on the sphere, and I can highlight all of the other faces and extrude them to give it a little bit of thickness. Once that's good to go, I can just delete history, center, pivot, and freeze transformations. And I'm gonna assign another material to it just so I can make it transparent so you can see how these gumballs are dropping. So once that's set up, I'm gonna create another smaller sphere and I can scale that down and duplicate it over five more times to create our gumballs. All I'm gonna do here is just assign different colors to each gumball. That way you can see how they're all dropping and mixing together in our bowl. So now that we have our five gumballs all set up, I'm gonna group those together. I can select all of those, go over to our FX tab on the very top and go over to Mash to create a Mash network. So all I'm gonna do here is go up to the distribution type and I can change that from linear to grid. And then you can play around with these points depending on how many gumballs you actually want in your scene. So in my case, in my video, I ended up just increasing these quite a bit. That way I can have a lot of different gumballs drop into my bowl. So I'm just gonna line up this bowl to my gumballs. So next I'm just gonna go over to my mash network and I'm gonna create an ID node. So this is gonna change all of my gumballs from being the same color from this light green into those individual colors that we had earlier in our scene. So I'm just gonna mess around with these values a little bit more so I can increase the amount of gumballs in our scene. So once I'm happy with how everything's looking, I can go back to our mash network and I can create a dynamics node. 
What this is going to do is allow me to add that physics to these balls so I can drop them into our container. So after creating that dynamics node, you'll notice in our outliner, it created a bullet solver. So what I can do is go over to that bullet solver and click it. And I just need to change a few of the values. So all we're going to do here is change that collision iteration. So we're going to drag that up to 10 and we're going to change that internal frame rate up to 120. I'm also going to drag then that collision margin slider all the way down to zero. Then just below that in the collider objects, I can middle mouse click that bowl we created earlier and I can drag that into that section. This is just going to make that bowl a collider so our gumballs can actually drop into it. So once you hit play on your timeline, you will notice how those gumballs will drop and sit inside of that container. And that's exactly what we want. So all I did here was just play the video until those gumballs dropped into a position I was happy with. And once they were sitting nicely in the container, I could just delete the history on them, copy them and paste them into our other scene that we made earlier. So let's just jump back into our other scene so I can show you exactly how I position those gumballs into our model. All right, so now back into our original scene, you can see just to the right, all of those other gumballs I was telling you were failing on me earlier. However, we have our colored gumballs that we just created that we're gonna paste inside of our model. So I'm just gonna scale that nice and small and I can position that inside of our bowl. So in our other scene, when I was creating these gumballs, I actually forgot to UV them ahead of time, which is something you should probably do. Now, rather than redoing all of that work, what I'm going to do is separate all of these gumballs into individual objects. I can manually go in and select all of the same colors, and I can group all of those same UV shells in our UV editor and drag them off to the side. So hopefully at the end of this, I'll have four or five different UV shells for all of the different colors. That way later on in Substance Painter, applying these materials to all of these gumballs will be very straightforward and we can fill them all in very easily. Also, while I was creating the physics for these gumballs, I created a simple bowl shape. So as you can see, they aren't filling in the very bottom of this gumball machine that we have. So while they're already separated, I'm just going to manually go in and start duplicating individual gumballs just to fill in that empty space in the bottom. Then once I'm happy with the whole shape and how those gumballs are looking, I can just select them all again and recombine them into one object. So let's go ahead and start wrapping up these gumballs. All right, and just like that, all of our gumballs are complete. We filled up our whole container, and now we can move on to a few other things. So really quickly, I'm just gonna clean up this outliner a tiny bit by grouping and naming all of these groups. And then really quickly before we move on to those UVs, there's a few other small objects that I thought we should add. So one of those things is the back label. I noticed on these gumball machines, there's a little metal plaque that sits on the very back that gives like information about the brand or something along those lines. So we're going to quickly add that and I always like to add a little personal touch if I can to make these models a little bit more interesting. So we're going to add a small little sticky note as well that's basically just a little written note to whoever to fill up the gumball machine before they leave on the weekend. I thought it'd be a little funny touch to add into the model. So let's wrap up these two last objects and then we can move on to the UVs. All right, so both that metal tag and that sticky note is complete, but I lied. There's still one more object I want to do before we move on to the UVs. And that's that top shape that's in, underneath the lid. It basically just helps screw that lid onto the object. And I'm not sure if this would be noticeable. We're not, we're not going to be having any upward angled renders or anything like that, but I thought you may see the very bottom of it and it'd be a nice little detail just to add to make it look a little bit more realistic. 
So I'm not gonna spend too long on the shape. I'm just gonna extrude some of those faces, merge them all directly in the middle so it looks like it's attached onto that pole. So let's just quickly wrap up this last object and then we can jump onto those UVs. Alright, and just like that, all of the 3D modeling is complete, and now we can move on to those UVs. Now I'm not going to show the whole UV mapping process, since it's the exact same thing over and over again. I use that 3D cut and sew UV tool, and I just create my own cuts and then lay them out on my UV editor. However, I will show a few of the objects, and then if you're interested in seeing the whole process, I will have a slower paced real time video which includes the whole UV mapping process available on my Patreon page, and I will link that in the description below. So for now, let's just jump into those UVs and I'll show you how I tackled some of these shapes. All right, so to start those UVs off, we're gonna select one of those inside shapes. And as you can see, there's no bevels or anything done to this. So what we're gonna do is select all of those outside edges and we can give them a small bevel. So now that the object is beveled, we can go back up to the mesh tab and I can smooth it out so the object is nice and smooth. All right, so now we're ready to UV. So we're just gonna remember to delete history, freeze transformations, and center pivot before we do anything. And then under the UV tab, I can go do a camera based projection to remove all of the cuts on the model. So now using the 3D cut and sew UV tool, I can go up to edge mode and I can start double clicking on those edges wherever I wanna create my own cuts. Once I have all of those cuts created, I can select all of those UV shells in my UV editor. I can control U to unfold and control L to lay them out. Then I just need to change the rotation so they look nice and clean in my UV editor. So at this point, I'm just going to repeat this exact same process for all of the other objects in my scene. And then we can group up all of those shells together into one nice and clean UV map. So we're going to jump to the next object in my outliner, which is the pole. And this is pretty straightforward. It's just a simple cylinder. So we're going to make sure those top and bottom faces are deleted, which they are. And I'm just going to add one little edge loop on the top. And that's just because I want to add some little rivets into the material and substance painter. And if I create that little section ahead of time, I can just fill in those faces in substance painter very easily and just going to make my life easier down the road. So now that we added that edge loop, I can simply delete history, freeze transformation, center pivot, select that UV shell, control U to unfold, control L to lay it out. And this time I'm under the unfold tab, I'm just gonna straighten the shell so it's nice and straight. And don't forget to give it a name in the outliner. And then once that's finished, we can jump to the next item in our outliner. So this object does have the bevels, but it's not smooth. So we're gonna go under mesh and smooth it out so it's nice and smooth. And I'm actually gonna increase the divisions up to two just because it wasn't looking smooth enough. I want it looking a little bit more realistic. So once again, I can do a camera based projection under the UV tab and using that 3D cut and sew UV tool, I can go ahead and start creating my own cuts wherever I want them. Now simply, I'm just gonna add two cuts on the bottom. You're not gonna see the bottom part so I can scale that in to fit inside of this ring, but I'm gonna have two UV shells. I can scale those down together in my UV editor. And once again, we have another object that UV'd. So I'm just gonna repeat this exact same process over and over again for all the objects in my scene. Now I'm not gonna make you watch that, but if you are interested, it will be available on my Patreon page. All right, so here's the model in its finished form. Now I did apply one material to everything, so you can't see the transparency of this glass anymore, but if I hide this object, you'll see how I combine all of these gumballs back into one object. Now, to be honest, you can combine everything into one object. Just for this case, I'm not going to, but if you were gonna use this in a video game or something like that, you should definitely combine all of these shapes since we're really not gonna be animating anything. Now, if I open up that UV editor, you'll see how I did those UVs. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I did rush these a little bit. There's some shapes like this one, for example, I could have straightened that out and some of these little curved ones as well, but I had so much room to work with in this UV editor, I just rushed it, and to be honest, this is gonna work, it's good enough. Now, like I did mention, I forgot to UV those gumballs, but since they're one color, I'm not too worried about it, so I ended up splitting these up 
into a few different colors. So for all of these, for example, are gonna be all the red and these will be all the blue and yellow and so on. So in Substance Painter, applying materials to these gumballs is gonna be very, very straightforward and easy. But that's how I did those UVs. Now let's jump into Substance Painter so we can start texturing. All right, so now jumping over to Substance Painter, we can go ahead and load in our FBX file from Maya. And if everything's looking good, we can go to our texture set settings, scroll down to bake mesh maps, and we can choose our output size. I chose 4K and make sure to check on that use low poly mesh as high poly mesh since we only have one mesh to work with. Now we do want transparency on our glass, so we do have to change our shader. So top right corner shader settings, change it from rough to alpha blending. Then we can scroll down to that little plus icon where we can add more channels and we can simply add an opacity channel so we can make it transparent. All right, so since we're talking about glass, let's start off with our glass. So I'm gonna go over to my Smart Materials tab. I'm gonna go choose that dry mirror material that comes with Substance Painter. We can turn off that dirt layer since we don't need it. And we can apply this material to our glass. Now all I have to do is just tweak that opacity. I'm actually gonna drag it quite low just right now while we're working in our scene. And then later on, I can drag it back up a little bit for those final renders. All right, so now that we have that glass material applied and I can see those gumballs and all the other objects, now we can jump to our main red color texture that's on the outside paint. So for this, I'm just gonna use that plastic glossy smart material that comes with Substance. I really like this material because it has a little bit of bump to it and I didn't want the paint material to look too clean. I find in a lot of these old gumball machines through the reference, they're a little bit warpy and a little bit bumpy and there's something to it. And I find this glossy material is just a perfect match for this material. All I have to do is change it from blue to more of a redder color. And I also found the bump was just a little bit too much, so I just added in the levels and I can change it to affect only the height channel. And I can just drag those sliders depending on how much bump I wanna show in that material. And once I was happy with how it was looking, I can right click set it to a black mask and using the polygon fill tool, I can fill in whatever meshes in my scene I want to apply this material to. So I was experimenting a little bit here and I thought it was looking a little bit too clean. So I went over to the textures tab and I dragged on a random grungy texture that I found right onto the roughness value of that glossy paint material we applied earlier. I was just experimenting with different roughness values and I thought it might look cool if I added some sort of texture to that roughness. Now since we added that roughness texture to our paint, I also thought we should add that to our glass. More so because the glass was looking way too clean and it needed some sort of grunge or smears on it just to make it look more realistic. So doing the exact same process, we're going to choose another texture and we can drag it onto our roughness value. Alright, so things are starting to look good. Now I just want to start filling in all of these empty meshes with the materials and then we can start tweaking values to make it look more accurate to what we have in mind. So next is just the very bottom, I'm going to choose a random smart material, a plastic material and I can apply it to that bottom piece under our gumball machine. All right, so next was that front metal piece. Now, I originally started with that Iron Forge Smart Material. It's one of my favorites metal materials in Substance Painter, but it just wasn't looking exactly what I had in mind or accurate to my reference photo, so I decided to use that Silver Armor Material, which is probably my favorite metal material in Substance Painter. I love this material. I find it's so diverse and you can use it in so many different ways it fit perfectly so I decided to go ahead with this and just tweak some of those values to make it look more like my reference. All right so now that the metal is looking good next is doing all of those leaf patterns on top of it. Now I looked at my reference and it seemed like they were changed depending on which reference photo you were looking at but they tend to be all similar just like a leaf pattern with these little dots and circles. So I jumped onto Google and I just googled random leaf patterns brought that into Photoshop, made them a black and white image that I can use as an alpha, and I drag those directly into my scene so I can paste it directly onto my metal. So all I'm gonna do here is add a fill layer. I just need to turn off all of those channels to only affect the height channel. As long as it's sitting inside of my silver armor folder, it's only gonna affect the height value of that silver armor. So what I'm gonna do is drag in one of those alphas that I created in Photoshop, and then I can double click that alpha to assign it to this brush and then simply paste on that image directly onto the metal. And all I have to do is change that height value depending on how much of a bump I wanna show on top of that metal. 
So let's go ahead and start pasting on this leaf pattern all over this object. Once again, not worrying about making it identical to my other reference. It's just gonna look similar and I can basically create my own patterns. So let's go ahead and fill this object out. All right, and just like that, our leaf pattern is complete. I think it looks pretty good. Once again, not identical to the reference, but I think this works. So next up were our gumballs. Now this is very straightforward. I'm just gonna choose a random smart material and assign it to the gumball, and then I can just change the color for all the other gumballs in my scene. Now originally I only had four different gumballs, but I thought it would look better if I added a fifth. And you'll see soon enough when we go to the back label, that little plaque on the very back of our gumball machine, it was very small in our UV map. So the text wasn't very legible. So I just wanted to enlarge that object in our UV map. That way I can just have clear print on that label. So while I jumped back into Maya to resize that UV shell, I also decided to group together a few of the gumballs and just drag those UV shells over to a different spot. So then I can add an additional color to all of my gumballs. So as you can see, I originally had only five gumballs. So I had pink, white, yellow, green, and blue. But I thought adding a sixth gumball, which I ended up making red, would just make it more fun to look at with more colors. All right, so gumballs complete. Next up are those inner objects. So we're gonna start off with that metal pole and I'm just gonna add that silver armor material and assign it to that mesh. Now, like I mentioned back when we were doing those UVs, I added that one edge loop on the top of our pole so I can add some sort of rivet pattern. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna add another fill layer. I can turn off all of those channels so I only have the height channel applied. And I can go over to my textures tab and if you scroll down to the very bottom of the list, there's this really nice stripes texture that you can apply to that height channel. And then all I have to do is just scale that down and change the orientation so it looks like those rivets are lined up correctly. All right, so really quickly, I'm just gonna jump into the renderer to see how these little rivets are looking. I know it's gonna look different than in the editor, so I'm just gonna jump back and forth a little bit so I can tweak it just to finalize this pattern so it looks correct on my pole. All right, so next up is just that top plastic piece that's holding that pole in place that's attached to the lid. So we're just gonna choose a simple plastic smart material and assign it to that mesh as well. And then on the very front where you insert those coins or that small little piece we added as well. So once again, I'm gonna add another plastic piece. In all my reference, it looks like a simple gray plastic piece. So we're just gonna try to copy that same look. All 
All right, so things are looking good. We only have a few other meshes to apply some materials to. So we're gonna spin this object around and we're gonna work on that back little nameplate that sits on the back of this object. So this is fairly easy. It's a pretty clean looking nameplate. So we're gonna go choose one of those iron shiny materials that come with substance. We can assign it to our mesh. Now I just wanna make sure to drag down the tiling. I don't want those metal lines to be too obvious so we can shrink them down a bit so it blends in with the material more. Now it was looking a little bit too clean, so we're going to add a little fill layer on top of this and then go over to our masks tab and just drag on one of those masking effects so I can add some more dirt and grunge on top of it. So next it was time to add that font and like I mentioned earlier in the video, the UV shell was very very small in my UV editor so once I apply those text to this label, you'll see they just don't seem too legible. So what I decided to do was jump back into Maya so I can enlarge that UV shell so I can basically make that text more legible to the viewer. And while I was in Maya, I decided to change that color of gumball like I mentioned earlier as well. So let's quickly jump over and do that and we can load this model back in and rebake those textures. All right, so now we have an updated model. Now really quickly, before we go back to that label on the back of this object, we are gonna quickly add one more color to our gumballs. And like I mentioned, I decided to go with red. So now we can jump back to that label we were originally working on and now that it's larger in our UV editor, I can actually add some print that's going to be legible to the viewer. So I'm just going to print on some random information like it's a nameplate and then we can move on to our little sticky note. Alright, so that nameplate is looking good. Next up is that sticky note. So what I decided to do for the main color was choose this cardboard paper material that I have in my substance library. Now if you don't, I believe I got this off of the Substance Source website, which you can download for free if you are a Substance Painter user. And then I just dragged that into my file and just applied it to my mesh. Now I didn't want this material to look too flat, so what I decided to do was use that fabric smart material, the flannel one that comes with Substance Painter. Now I opened up that folder and I grabbed the creases and folding effect pattern that comes with that texture and I just copied and pasted that onto my cardboard paper material. So then afterwards I can just delete that flannel folder and I only have the folding effect that comes with it and now I can apply it to my piece of paper. Now all I'm going to do here is just drag up that blur effect. I don't want those wrinkles to be so obvious but I just want it to be subtly there just so the paper doesn't look too flat. And then for the text, I can simply add another fill layer and then just basically using those built-in fonts that come with Substance Painter, I can just type in and write a little note to someone. So let's go ahead and wrap up this last little mesh in our scene. And finally, it was just looking a little bit too clean, so we are going to add one more fill layer and I can drag on a masking effect just to add a little bit of dirt and grunge on top of this note. Alright, so now we can zoom back out, spin around the model and take a look at how everything is looking. Now I noticed at the very front where that opening is where the gumballs drop, but it's looking too clean so I wanted to add a tiny bit of dirt and grunge. Not too much, but just very subtly. So I'm going to add another fill layer and I can drag on a masking effect and then just make that color more of a brown rusty color. And then once I'm happy with it, I can assign it to those two meshes that are on the inside of that opening. And then finally, the very last mesh I forgot to add a material to was that top screw. And this is going to be very straightforward. I'm going to use that silver armor, my favorite metal material in Substance Painter, and I can assign it to that screw. 
Now once that material is applied, I can quickly jump into the renderer to see how everything is looking. So all I do here is just check on clear ground. I don't want to see a background image. And then we can also just change the environmental map. So I change it from panorama to one of the studio lights or one of the other lights in the scene. And then I also scroll down to the camera settings and I change the focal length up from 17 to 50. So at this point, it's just a matter of tweaking things until I get them more into a final state that I'm happy with. Once again, I say this in mostly all of my videos, I personally find this is one of the most important parts of the whole texturing process. So once you have all of those meshes filled with materials and textures, you just have to spend some time tweaking some of those values so they can get closer to how they look in real life. I also find sometimes things look perfect in the editor and then you jump into the renderer and some of those values just seem off or more reflective than they should be so you just need to adjust some of those values just so they look more accurate. So all I do here going forward is just jump in and out of the renderer and start tweaking some of those materials and settings just so I can get it closer to a final state that I'm happy with. But that is everything. That is the whole texturing, modeling, and UVing process that I did to create this old gumball machine. If you're interested in seeing a real-time slower paced video, which also includes the whole UV mapping process, I will be uploading that video to my Patreon page, which you can find in the link in the description below. I will also be including the Substance Painter working file and the FBX file as well, so if you're interested in having access to those, check out my Patreon page as well. I will try to include the FBX and Substance Painter files for every video going forward that I put out on my YouTube channel. I know it can be helpful for people to have access to those working files to reference to as you're learning these softwares, so if that's something that interests you, you can definitely check that out on my Patreon page. Anyways, thanks so much for tuning into this week's video. If you liked the video, give it a like, and don't forget to subscribe to see more weekly 3D content. I'm on a mission to get to 10,000 subscribers, so if you'd like to help me get there, you know what to do. Anyways, thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.